What if your muscles start cooking you from the inside? This is essentially what happens in malignant hyperthermia. It's the anesthesia emergency that could turn a routine surgery into a race against time. Before we dive into this episode, don't forget to download the free worksheet associated with this topic located in the description below. And if you're interested in anesthesia, pharmacology, and science principles, subscribe to this channel so you're always the first to see our latest episodes. Imagine this, a routine surgery is underway and suddenly the patient's body temperature skyrockets to 109 degrees Fahrenheit. Their muscles lock up, their heart races, and then chaos erupts in the operating room. What's happening? This could be malignant hyperthermia, one of the most dangerous emergencies in anesthesia. Malignant hyperthermia is a rare but life-threatening condition triggered by certain anesthetic agents like volatile inhalational anesthetics or succinylcholine. Important to note, nitrous oxide is not a volatile anesthetic, it is a gas, so it is not a trigger for MH. In addition, non-depolarizing muscle relaxants like rocuronium, vecuronium, and cisatricurium are also not triggers for MH. There is also mounting evidence that MH may also be triggered in some patients by stressors, such as heat and vigorous exercise. MH is an inherited hypermetabolic disorder of the skeletal muscles caused by mutations in genes like RYR1, which codes for the ryanidine receptor that controls calcium regulation in skeletal muscle cells. There are actually over 30 different genetic mutations that can cause MH, so just keep in mind that the RYR1 gene is not the only one. Now, the ryanidine receptor actually sits on the surface of the sarcoplasmic reticulum in the skeletal muscle cell. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is the same as the endoplasmic reticulum, just in skeletal muscle cells. Remember, the role of calcium during a muscle contraction is to bind to troponin, a regulatory protein complex associated with actin filaments. This change in troponin moves tropomyosin away from the myosin binding sites on the actin filaments, so myosin can bind and cause a muscle contraction. During periods of relaxation, calcium is carefully sequestered out of the cell or into the sarcoplasmic reticulum so that continuous contractions don't occur. But when patients with MH are exposed to triggers like volatile agents or succinylcholine, calcium actually floods the muscle cell uncontrollably. This leads to a hypermetabolic state. Think of it as your body's engine revving out of control. The muscle cells continuously contract, and while the body tries to remove the excess calcium, it increases oxygen consumption, depletes ATP stores, generates lactic acid, and generates CO2 and heat production. The result, acidosis, hyperthermia, and ATP depletion destroys the sarcolemma, producing a massive spilling of potassium and myoglobin into the bloodstream. Untreated, the out-of-control heat production, muscle rigidity, and severe metabolic imbalances can quickly become fatal. Malignant hyperthermia is inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern, meaning that if one parent carries the gene mutation, there's a 50% chance that their child will inherit it. Several factors should be considered when assessing the likelihood of MH. A family history of malignant hypothermia or unexplained deaths during surgery is a significant indicator. Additionally, certain genetic muscle disorders, such as central core disease or multi-mini-core disease, are associated with mutations in the RYR1 gene and increase the risk of MH. Individuals with a personal history of unexplained heat stroke or exertional rhabdomyolysis may also be at greater risk. Importantly, even in the absence of a known family history, individuals can still carry the mutation and be susceptible to complications during anesthesia. Therefore, it's always crucial to maintain a high suspicion for malignant hypothermia in both children and adults. Malignant hypothermia often begins subtly, but can escalate rapidly, making early recognition very crucial. The hallmark signs and symptoms include an unexplained rise in antidal CO2, which is often the first clue, as CO2 levels can climb quickly despite normal ventilation. Patients may experience tachycardia as another early sign, with their heart rate spiking as the body enters overdrive. Muscle rigidity, particularly in the jaw or chest muscles, may occur following the exposure of triggering agents. And Despite the name, 
hyperthermia, which is of course characterized by a rapid increase in body temperature, is actually a late sign, but another alarming sign of MH. Additionally, both metabolic and respiratory acidosis can develop due to increased CO2 production and lactic acid buildup. Hyperkalemia and rhabdomyolysis are also significant concerns as muscle breakdown releases potassium into the bloodstream, potentially leading to dangerous arrhythmias. Recognizing these signs early is critical because untreated MH has actually a mortality rate of up to 80%. However, with proper and timely intervention with the life-saving medication Dantrolene, survival rates have actually exceeded 90% for those who experience this condition. When malignant hypothermia strikes, immediate and effective treatment is crucial. The first step is to halt the procedure and stop the trigger by discontinuing all volatile anesthetics and succinylcholine right away. If the triggering agent was volatile anesthetics, remove the vaporizer, change the soda lime, and flush the tubing and machine with 100% oxygen. Next, hyperventilating the patient with 10 liters per minute of 100% oxygen helps eliminate excess CO2 and combat acidosis. If your facility has it, insert activated charcoal filters on the inspiratory and expiratory limbs of the breathing circuit. These last approximately one hour before becoming saturated, so change them if necessary. Administering dantrolene, a life-saving drug that will be discussed in detail later, is a essential for managing the condition. Cooling the patient down is also vital. This can be achieved by using ice packs, cooling blankets, or cold IV fluids to help lower body temperature. Insert an OG or NG tube and Foley, and doing ice lavages with ice cold normal saline can help rapidly reduce body temperature. Cool the patient if the core temperature is over 39 degrees Celsius, and stop cooling when the temperature has decreased to less than 38 degrees. Make sure to appropriately monitor the core temperature, as certain temperature monitoring devices may not be accurate when you're doing ice lavages. For instance, an esophageal probe or Foley temperature probe may not be as accurate if you're doing OG tube or Foley catheter lavages. Just keep that in mind. Additionally, it's important to correct metabolic imbalances by treating acidosis with bicarbonate, one to two milliequivalents per kilogram if their base excess is greater than negative eight. Manage hyperkalemia with calcium gluconate or chloride, 10 milligrams per kilogram, or 10 units of insulin combined with 10 milliliters of 50% dextrose. You want to check the glucose levels hourly after administration of these medications. If the hyperkalemia is refractory, meaning it just won't come down, consider a beta agonist like albuterol, dialysis, or even ECMO if the patient is going into cardiac arrest. Treat arrhythmias with lidocaine, one milligram per kilogram, but avoid calcium channel blockers in these patients. Secure an arterial line to continuously monitor the hemodynamics. Protect the renal function from spilled myoglobin that may cause rhabdomyolysis by maintaining IV fluids at one to eight milliliters per kilogram and diuresing with furosemide IV to maintain the urine output over one milliliter per kilogram per hour. Bicarbonate infusions at one milliequivalent per kilogram per hour will also make the urine more alkaline. Obtain ABDs and an EKG to monitor your resuscitation progress to check on metabolic disturbances and arrhythmias. So once stabilized, send the patient to the ICU for at least 24 hours for further management. Early recognition and immediate treatment are key to preventing severe complications, such as cardiac arrest or organ failure. However, even if treated promptly and correctly, patients are still at high risk for complications like pulmonary edema, consumptive coagulopathy, compartment syndrome, myoglobinuric renal failure, hepatic dysfunction, and cerebral edema. Now, Dantrolene is the cornerstone of malignant hypothermia treatment and is literally a lifesaver in this critical condition. It's actually a muscle relaxant, but rather than working on the neuromuscular junction like other muscle relaxants, it works by inhibiting calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum in muscle cells, effectively halting the hypermetabolic crisis associated with MH. One vial of dantrolene has 20 milligrams that has to be reconstituted with 60 milliliters of sterile water for injection, and the vial is shaken until the solution is clear. The solution is alkaline and highly irritating to blood vessels. Administer it in the largest vein possible. The recommended initial dose is 2.5 milligrams per kilogram administered intravenously with additional doses given every five to 10 minutes as needed until the patient responds with a decreased end tidal CO2, decreased muscle rigidity, or a lowered heart rate. So 
For an 80 kilogram patient, that would be 80 kilograms times 2.5 mg per kg would equal 200 milligrams. And if each vial is 20 milligrams, this patient would require 10 vials. And that's just for one dose. Large doses over 10 mg per kg may be required for patients with persistent contractures or rigidity. But to note, if you're giving large doses without any symptom resolution, consider an alternative diagnosis. And we'll cover other differential diagnoses towards the end of this video. It is essential that every operating room has as dantrolene readily available, as delays in its administration can be deadly. Currently, there are two formulations of dantrolene, the traditional formulation, which requires lengthy reconstitution, and a newer formulation called Ryanodex, which mixes more quickly, but it's more expensive. Each vial of Ryanodex has 250 milligrams and is reconstituted with only 5 milliliters of sterile water for injection, which produces an orange opaque suspension. Just to note, the dose is the same for either the formulation, 2.5 mg per kg. So for your 80 kilogram patient, they only need one vial of Ryanodex for each dose. A common question preceptors like to throw out is, how many grams of mannitol is in each vial of dantrolene or in each vial of Ryanodex? Stay till the end to find out the answer. If you're ever faced with an MH crisis or even suspect one, Help is just a phone call away. Actually, the Malignant Hypothermia Association of the United States, or MHouse, operates a 24-7 hotline staffed by experts who can guide you through diagnosis and treatment in real time. The number is really easy to remember. 1-800-MH-HYPER. This resource has saved countless lives by providing immediate support to anesthesia teams worldwide. In fact, it is expected that providers call during an MH emergency, so an expert can be with you during the resuscitation period. Remember these key indicators that the patient is responding to your treatment. End tidal CO2 is declining or is now normal. The heart rate is stable or decreasing with no signs of ominous dysrhythmias. The hyperthermia is resolving and the generalized muscle rigidity has resolved. While in the ICU, patients may require additional doses of dantrolene and continue supportive care. Doses for dantrolene include one milligram per kilogram every four to six hours or 0.25 mg per kg per hour by continuous infusion. MH can recur in the ICU after an intraoperative episode in 25% of cases, so it's super important that ICU providers maintain continued vigilance during the first 24 hours after an MH event. So how about some clinical tips? In clinical practice, Malignant hypothermia remains rare but devastating when it occurs. Most cases happen during general anesthesia when triggering agents are used, but sometimes it doesn't happen right after exposure, but hours into the case. Or MH can also occur postoperatively in the PACU, so vigilance doesn't end when the surgery ends. Preoperative screening is crucial for identifying patients at risk, so ask about personal or family history of anesthesia complications or unexplained deaths during surgery during every preoperative interview. If your facility has dantrolene instead of Ryanodex, it can be very time consuming to mix up all the vials needed to give the patient the proper dose. Call in for tons of backup help from your colleagues to help mix those dantrolene vials and do other tasks like cooling the patient and getting the acidosis under control. Facilities must also be prepared with an MH cart stocked with dantrolene cooling supplies, and emergency protocols. If you are new to a facility, always know where the MH cart is located. The moment an MH crisis occurs is not the time to go searching for that cart. If surgery must continue, maintain general anesthesia with IV non-triggering anesthetics like propofol, opioids, benzodiazepines, and non-depolarizing muscle relaxants like rocuronium. And if you know about an MH history prior to the surgery or have a high suspicion prior to the case, you can take a lot of steps to prevent an MH crisis from occurring. First, remove the vaporizer from the machine and flush the machine for 10 to 20 minutes straight with the O2 flush valve, or you can leave the O2 running at over 10 liters per minute. Change the circuits and the soda lime and put on the charcoal filters if you have them. In the drug drawers, remove or tape over the succinylcholine to prevent any provider from administering it. Make it very clear during your report if you go on break or another provider takes over the case that the patient has MH. Create a plan to administer total intravenous anesthesia using a propofol drip and a non-depolarizing muscle relaxant. Also consider regional and local anesthetics as an alternative to general anesthesia. Put the MH cart in the room 
and make sure it's fully stocked. Also, keep patients in the PACU for a minimum of one hour and in phase two for another hour if they're going to be discharged to home. Give patients clear guidance on signs and symptoms and how to manage these complications. Hint, call 911. So what about differential diagnoses? When considering malignant hyperthermia, it's essential to differentiate it from several other conditions that may present with similar symptoms. Key differential diagnoses include neuroleptic malignant syndrome, pheochromocytoma, sepsis, thyroid storm, and serotonin syndrome. To rule out neuroleptic malignant syndrome, Clinicians should assess for a history of antipsychotic medication use and look for muscle rigidity and altered mental status, which are more pronounced in this condition. Pheochromocytoma can be excluded by measuring catecholamine levels in the plasma or urine, as well as assessing for paroxysmal hypertension. In cases of suspected sepsis, Blood cultures and laboratory tests should be conducted to identify the infection and systemic inflammatory response. Thyroid storm can be ruled out through thyroid function tests that reveal elevated levels of thyroid hormone. Lastly, serotonin syndrome is characterized by specific clinical features such as hyperreflexia and clonus, which can help differentiate it from MH. A thorough medication history is also crucial in this context. By carefully evaluating these factors and conducting appropriate lab tests, clinicians can effectively distinguish malignant hyperthermia from these other serious conditions. Malignant hyperthermia may be rare, but its impacts can be catastrophic without prompt recognition and treatment. We've covered everything from its pathophysiology to signs and symptoms, treatment options like dantrolene, and even resources like the MH hotline that can help save lives. As healthcare providers, or even as informed patients, it's our responsibility to stay vigilant and prepared for these emergencies. If you want more information about MH, visit the MHouse website at mhouse.org. By the way, there are three grams of mannitol in one vial of dantrolene and 0.25 grams of mannitol in one vial of Ryanodex. There's always a tricky preceptor out there that will ask you this, so keep these gems in the back of your pocket or your notebooks. If you found this video helpful or know someone who might benefit from learning about malignant hypothermia, please share it. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more high-yield anesthesia educational content.